Okay, so what I'm going to go over, I'm not going to, I'm not covering it to insult you by any means. Um, I'm, I'm covering it to kind of help you to see some patterns that happen in numbers. Because as I mentioned, I, I've found through the years that most of the struggles with the higher level stuff, the advanced algebra and things like that, come from not really understanding what's going on with the simple things at the very base. All the way down to the most basic concept. Let's get out of here. The most basic concept in algebra, which is, what is a number? If I were to put a four up here, show of hands, how many of you would tell me that's a number? Most people would, right? You're thinking, now oh, there's got to be a trick behind it. That is actually what's called a numeral. It represents an amount, four. But to truly be a number, there's another part to it. Not only has to tell us how many, but of what. So I might say four cows. So now this is truly a number because it has two parts. It tells me how many. Four, which I refer to as the count. That's the amount. But it also tells us of what? Cows, in this case. And I refer to that as the name. Now, I'm not doing this. I'm not one of those teachers that's, that's going to say, you have to label everything or I'm going to mark it wrong. That's not my purpose here. Um, there actually is a significant use of those two parts when we look at calculations with numbers. So to demonstrate that, let's look at our two most basic operations in math. Addition and multiplication. Now you might be wondering, where did subtraction and division go? Well, in, in mathematics, all operations come in pairs what we call inverses. Um, addition and subtraction are one of those pairs. They're inverses. They're really the same operation. Addition is going forward. Subtraction is going in reverse. You think about it, if you have a number and you add four to it, well, if you subtract four, you get right back to where you started. They undo each other. That's why they're called inverses. So addition and subtraction all follow the same rules. So anything that applies to addition applies into subtraction in the same way. The same with multiplication and division. <clears throat> so we look at an example here of adding. Let's take something like four inches plus seven inches. What do we get? Don't be shy. 11 inches, there we go. Not really ground shattering information, but let's take a look at what happened with our count and our name. So for counts, we had four and seven. We combined those, we were adding, so we combined them with addition to get 11. So when we add and when we subtract numbers, we combine the counts using the operation. What happened with the names? We had inches and inches, and it became inches. We kept the same name. When we add numbers and when we subtract numbers, we combine counts, and we keep the same name. Well, that might not seem terribly... cutting edge right now, but it, it's very different with some of our other operations. <coughs> Let's look at multiplication and division. If I have four inches times seven inches, what do I get? Somebody in Ashland, what do we get when we do four inches times seven inches? What's four times seven? 28, good. And what's the units going to be on that? It's not going to be inches, but inches squared. Very good. If you think about it, if we're multiplying 4 inches times 7 inches, chances are what we're looking at is a rectangle, and we're looking at finding an area. So it's going to be inches squared. So 
So let's look at our count and our name there. We have four and seven yet, but we're multiplying. So we combine them with multiplication to get 28. So we still combine the counts. We had inches and inches for names and it became inches squared. When we multiply and when we divide, not only do we combine the counts, but we also combine the names. Inches times inches became inches squared. That difference between addition, subtraction, and multiplication and division is huge. Because not only does it tell us how to combine the numbers, but it actually even tells us what numbers we can use in each operation. To illustrate that, let's try something like, well, let's say I have three cows plus five boys. Do I get eight cowboys? No. As a math teacher, I'm required to have a stupid sense of humor, so you get used to it. Or if I do it the other way around, you guys are familiar with commutative properties for addition and multiplication. You can change the order of the two numbers. Five boys plus three cows. And it shouldn't change your answer. Does that give us eight boy cows? No. Anybody here with a farming background? Nobody? No, even so, you may be able to tell me that that is a bunch of bull. Bad joke. Long ways to go for a joke. But anyway, there's a point behind it. We cannot add three cows and five boys because when we add numbers, we are going to combine the counts, but we're also, after we combine the counts, we're going to keep the same name. What that implies is that we had to start with the same name. If those names are different, we don't know which one to keep. So when we add or subtract, we can only combine things that start out having the same name. When we multiply or divide, we're going to combine names so we don't have to start out with the same name. Let's use a little bit more practical illustration than the, of this rather than cows and boys. If I have two feet plus five pounds, I get two feet plus five pounds, right? They have different names. I cannot add those. However, if I have two feet times five pounds, when I multiply or divide, I combine counts. What's two times five? 10. And then I also combine the names. Feet times pounds is foot pounds. If you've worked on engines at all, you know the units of torque. Um, and structural engineering is my background. That's a unit of moment. That is a legitimate unit. So 10 foot-pounds. When we multiplied, we did not have to have the same name. Now, again, that might not seem like earth-shattering, groundbreaking material here. But that explains all those separate rules we've been taught for our other types of numbers are explained by that simple difference. Let's go to everybody's favorite. Fractions. Note a touch of sarcasm in my voice there. I realize that if I asked people on their way in the door what their biggest struggle was in math or what they hated most about math, probably four out of five would say fractions. The other one would probably say the teacher. So, to review a little bit, that top number is called what? Anybody? Numerator, there we go. And the bottom number? There we go, thank you. Denominator. I admit to have poor handwriting. But I also admit to being a horrible speller. Um, if anything ever appears up on here that you can't read, I assure you it was intended to be in English. I probably butchered the spelling. Don't be afraid to, to ask me what something's supposed to say. 
you haven't figured out right now, you really can't defend me by asking questions. So please feel free. But let's look at this in a little more detail. We have the numerator and denominator. To numerate um, every 10 years, in fact, coming up next year, our government sends out people to numerate the population, to do the census. What are they doing? They're counting. A numerator is a count. Denominator. Well, we have different denominations of money, um, different denominations of, of religious organizations. To denominate is to classify or to give a name. So a numerator and denominator are really just a count and a name. Um, most people look at a fraction and they see two numbers. It isn't two numbers. It's one number with two parts. Just like having three cows, we can have three sevenths. So when we go to add fractions, back in about third grade or so when we first learned to add fractions, that third grade teacher told us to add or subtract fractions, you must have a common, common denominator. There we go. Again, that's nothing new for fractions. Anytime we have add numbers, we must start with the same name. Then we add those fractions. They said, combine the numerators, add the numerators. Three plus two is five and... Keep the common denominator. Again, that's nothing new for fractions. Every time we add numbers, we combine the counts and we keep the same name. So the rules are the same. If I wanted to try to add two-fifths plus one-third, can I add those the way they're written? No, because they have different names. Multiplying. Three sevenths times two sevenths. When we were taught to multiply, what were we taught to do? Multiply straight across, right? Numerator times numerator, three times two is six. Denominator times denominator, seven times seven is 49. Again, that's not a special rule for fractions. Anytime we multiply fraction, multiply any number, we combine the counts, that's multiplying the numerators, and we also combine the names, that's multiplying denominators. If I add, come on, two-fifths times one-third, can I multiply those? I sure can. Two times one is two, I multiply the counts. Five times three is 15, I multiply the names. Let's check out decimals. 0.21 is a decimal. What's the formal way of pronouncing that? 21. Hundreds. Thank you. When we write that way, we can see that there is a count and a name there. If I were trying to add two decimals, let's say I've got 0.21 plus 0.3. Is that going to work like that? No. What, what do I need to do to make that work? When I set it up, I have to make sure I do what? There we go. Line up the decimal points or add a zero, depending on how you look at it. Back that third grade teacher again, right, told us when you add decimals, Got to make sure the decimal points are lined up. Well, why? Well, this is 21 hundredths. This is three tenths. They have different names. When we add decimals, when we add any numbers. They have to have the same name. So, yeah, we put that zero back there, and that becomes 30 hundredths. Now they have the same name, and those decimal points line up. So lining up the decimal points when we add and subtract decimals is simply making sure they have the same name.
Then we add, we've got one, five, where does the decimal point go? We bring, bring it straight down, don't we? Why is that? Well, this is 21 hundredths, this is 30 hundredths, we have to get 51 hundredths. Bringing the decimal point straight down is nothing more than making sure we keep the same name. If I were to multiply 0.21 times 0.3, do I have to worry about lining up the decimal points? No. When we multiply, we do not need the same name. So 21 times 3 is 63. Where does my decimal point go? Remember, I have to add a zero, and the decimal point goes in front of that, doesn't it? Can anybody remember why I put it there? We were taught when you multiply decimals, you have to go one, two, three decimal places in the problem, total decimal places. You have to count one, two, three total decimal places in the answer, right? So the question is why? third grade teacher said so. Well, if we look at it, this is 21 hundredths. And this is 3 tenths. When we multiply, we multiply counts. 21 times 3 is 63. But we also combine the names. Hundredths times tenths is thousandths. So when we're counting those decimal places in the problem and making sure we have that many decimal places in the answer, all we're doing is making sure we also combine the names. That goes right into our algebraic numbers. This is where a lot of people, my WITC students get nervous, put letters with the numbers. 4x is just what we call an algebraic number. It works just like four inches or four cows. We have a count of four and a name of x. If I did 4x plus 7x, I'm going to get 11x. Very good. I combine the counts. 4 plus 7 is 11. And I keep the same name of x. If I had... 2x plus 5y, I get 2x plus 5y. Very good. Just like 2 feet plus 5 pounds was 2 feet plus 5 pounds, they have different names. So 2x plus 5y stays 2x plus 5y. On the other side, if we were multiplying 4x times 7x, we combine the counts, four times seven is 28. And just like inches times inches became inches squared, x times x becomes x squared, good. Or if we add two x, come on, two x times five y, just like two feet times five pounds, we multiply the counts, two times five is 10. And just like feet times pounds became foot pounds, X times Y becomes XY. Perfect. This even defines how we work with larger numbers. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. We only have seven and a half minutes left, so I can't spend a lot of time on it. But place values. Um, I'm not going to put the chart up there because hopefully we all know our place values by now. But when we see numbers like 328, what we're used to seeing there is just an abbreviation of the number. And we can abbreviate it because of those place values. The full form of that number is really this, 300 plus two tens plus eight ones. When we add or subtract, let's say we want to add that 
461. If we put them in this full form or expanded form, our process of adding and subtracting makes more sense. When we add or subtract, we can only combine things that have the same name. Well, that goes right down to the individual digit. I can only combine tens with other tens, hundreds with other hundreds. Well, you know, we were always taught when you add or subtract, you gotta line up those columns. Here's the reason why. We have to line up the place values because we can only combine digits that have the same name. So we've got nine ones, eight tens, and seven hundreds, 189. Subtraction is the same thing. Multiplication to 43 times 32. If you write those out in full form, four tens plus three ones, and three tens plus two ones. When we multiply, we do not have to have the same name. So not only can I multiply, combine these two tens with the three ones, I can also combine them with the four tens. So when I multiply numbers, I can combine every digit in one number with every digit in the other number. And our process of long multiplication is nothing more than an organized way of making sure that happens. We start, usually we start with the bottom number and its last digit, and we combine that with the last digit of the first number. Two times three is six, but we also combine the names. Ones times ones is ones. Then we move over to the next digit in the top number. Two ones times four tens. Two times four is eight. Ones times tens is tens. So we've combined that two ones with every digit in the top number, it's time to move over to the next digit. Now we were always taught that you either have to put a zero or leave a blank here. The reason for that will be apparent now. So we take that three tens times three ones, three times three is nine, tens times ones is tens. We put that zero in there so that we made sure our place values stayed lined up. Tens line up with other tens. Three tens times four tens is 12. Three times four is 12. We'll have to carry here. Tens times tens is hundreds. So 12 hundreds, we're going to keep the two hundreds and we'll carry the one over into the thousand place. So we add things up. Six, 17, we got to carry. We won. So 1,376. Now I realize for this being an algebra course, not an arithmetic course, many of you are gonna use your calculators. I understand I would use my calculator when I have the chance as well, but I would hope that you would look at something like this before you punch it in the calculator and think, okay, that's about 40, that's about 30, four times three is 12, tens times tens is hundreds. I'm expecting an answer close to 1200. The reason I say that, Anything like me, I have these kind of sausage stubby fingers. When I go to punch something like that in, it is not uncommon for me to have something like this to happen. What went wrong there? I hit an extra key in there. I hit the three a second time. Um, if we're going too fast and not thinking about it, calculator is always right. So we write down that answer and we keep going. But if we just take a moment to think before we, we punch it in, we know that we're expecting an answer around 1,200. 14,000 doesn't make sense. So we, we don't catch every mistake, but we'll catch a lot of them by just doing a quick estimate. Same with the addition up here. So this is about 300. This is about 500. I'm expecting something close to 800. 789, if my calculator spits that out, is reasonable to me. Okay, I've, there's other things I would love to show you, but I'm out of time. One of the things I'd like to show you is long division. So if we get time at the end of one of our classes next week, 
maybe remind me and I'll show you the, the actual process of long division. What we've learned as long division is nothing like what the real process is. Everything we've learned in math is really a shortcut. Um, even down to our addition. Something like this, you know, we've always been taught you work right to left, you go backwards. Eight plus seven is 15, so you get the five, carry the one. One plus seven is eight, plus five is 13, so three, carry the one. One, four, and two make seven. That's a shortcut. The actual process of addition. Looks like this. Four plus two is six. 7 plus 5 is 12, so 2 drop the 1. 8 plus 7 is 15, so 5 drop the 1. 6 and 1 is 7, 2 and 1 is 3, and 5. Notice you get the same answer. Now, I was always taught this way. Um, if you talk to any of your grandparents, there's a chance that some of them were probably taught this way. It's a long way of doing it. I don't expect you to change how you add, but I showed you that mainly for... One of the misconceptions in math is that there's only one correct way to do things. There's only one correct answer, but there's often multiple ways to get to that answer. So if you have a way of doing stuff that's different from what I show you, and I'll try to show you, in most cases, at least a couple of different ways of doing things. But if you have a way that's different from those, um, please feel free to, to let me know and I'll be happy to take a look at it and make sure it is a method that always works because there are multiple ways of doing things in most math procedures. Okay, that is our time. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, like I said, there's no real official homework for, for this week. The only thing is if you are not enrolled in my math lab, make sure you are, you are enrolled in that by Monday, because our math lab assignments do start on Monday. And as I said, even though there are deadlines listed for homework, the official deadline for everything for the week is always the following Monday. Okay, well, you guys have a great weekend. It was nice to meet all of you, and we'll see you back on Monday next week.